They just left me hanging by myself. Bob took the batteries out of this morning. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. <clears throat> I love seeing this thing. Yes. This is wonderful. Yeah. You bet. <laughs> so for prayer request this morning, we got a pretty extensive list here. Um, be with Butch and Lorita, your prayers. <clears throat> Loretta's not with us today. He said, Butch needed a little more emotional support today and have family coming. And they'll start doing the travel back and forth down to Barnes. Um, his test wasn't good, that there was cancer in the tonsil, and another one besides his original cancer. So, um, Sandy Campbell's having back surgery. There's more needed. Uh, Judy Bankley is recovering from five bypasses and an aortic valve replacement. 80 years old. And 80 years old. And Harry Bycroft for continued recovery and encouragement. And he's 80 years old. And he's 80 and lost a leg. And if anybody saw his birthday picture, the kids got him a shirt that says officially on my last leg. So, <laughs> <laughs> and Harry just laughing up so so. And happy birthday, Marilyn. Um, prayers for Kay Adair. She's in Blessing Quincy. She has um, a third degree heart blockage. She's got a temporary pacemaker and I'm waiting for a permanent one next week. And the family of Isabel Ferris. And please pray that I keep finding the right words to gently share and encourage my husband and family to come to God and to grow their faith. <clears throat> we got prayers for John's mom. Uh, Tim the Hathaway, who's Dave and Marilyn's neighbor, he's down Springfield. Right? Um, then we got some praises here. Praise for a wonderful turnout yesterday, and praises for 52 years together. And then P.S. He do it again. <laughs> Happy anniversary, Stephen Lennon. <laughs> Dave, you must be a saint. Yeah. 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 But I think it was the cream puffs that came. <laughs> um, also, I had a test done on Wednesday to have my larynx and vocal cords scoped, and everything came back clear, but they still don't know why I get hoarse so much. So we're trying a different route. So. I can tell them. Huh? You can tell them? And. Um, this week we had a little God moment. Corey was in God put him in the right place at the right time for a distraught man who'd lost a seven year old daughter. Aww. And then the man I ended up talking to him on the phone later. And it was just a God thing that everybody was where they were supposed to be. And that I was actually working in Macomb and not officially open yet, so I could talk to him on the phone. So and my little brother, Todd. Apparently decided 30 years of fear and dying men screaming, he was going to silence him. And his wife stopped him. He is now at the psych ward at the Heinz VA up by Chicago. So we're praying he gets the help that he needs. <clears throat> so, so join me in prayer. Merciful, gracious God, we thank you for the day you've given us. It is the day that we come to seek you in our lives more, to worship you, to remember who you are and what you are. And Lord, as we come as a church family to give you praise, honor, and glory, you know, Lord, we come with burdens also. Seems like constantly we're asking you for things, but you know our needs 
and what we want before we even come to you. Lord, we ask for healings. We ask for understanding. We ask for comfort. We ask for guidance. We ask that your hand be upon us and pull us out of those dark places and bring us into your light. And Lord, we also share in the celebration of another year on this earth. And as we question in Sunday school, why? What is the plan? What am I supposed to be doing? And Lord, we know that plan will be revealed. But we stay steadfast in your word. We let our actions and our words show a little bit of who you are and what you are. We thank you so much that the community turned out, Lord, last night to our first little trunk or treat. It was a great time had by many. And I thank you, Lord, that your hand of protection is upon your people. We ask for an end to these wars. We ask for an end to the fighting. We ask for protection upon the military. But we know all these people, enemies and friends alike, are all your children. We pray most of all for a change of heart. Let those who do not know you find you. Let those who are struggling, trying to go through this life, trying to find the next best thing, realize it's been there all along. Lord, we ask you, just as your disciples did, when they said, Lord, you got to teach us to pray. And he taught them this. He said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the glory, and the power forever. Amen. <coughs> so I'm going to be in the book of Luke today, the 18th chapter, verses 9 to 14. It's also known as the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you, I'm not like these other people. Robbers, evildoers, adulterers are even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all that I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He could not even, lo even look up to heaven. But he beat his breast. And he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And I tell you that this man, rather than the others, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. <coughs> sorry. To be sorry means... I'm filled with sorrow. So what can this Pharisee and this tax collector teach us about the value of being filled with sorrow before our God? A woman told this story about she had with her four-year-old son. They'd just gotten out of their Bible study one night. And she said, my son and I were walking to her car, and he said, Mom, I'm not going to sin anymore. And I got wondering this, so I asked him why he said that. His answer was, Jesus says, if you don't sin, you can throw the first stone and I want to be able to toss that rock. <laughs> so our word for today is sorry. It used to be that in our culture, if an actor, politician, public figure said or did something they shouldn't have said, we're done. And they stood in front of a camera and they admitted to the world that they were wrong. Americans would often be willing just to give them a pass and forgive them. I mean, just say you're sorry. That's all the that people want to hear. But that's changed a lot over the last few years. We've now entered an era where people throw stones. It's called cancel culture. And it dominates social media and the internet. 
So if some comedian, actor, politician has said or done something that's offensive, even if it happened 30 years in the past, there can be no forgiveness ever. No matter how many times someone says, I'm sorry, those critics will never forgive. An agnostic by the name of Andrew Sullivan observed that the cancel culture is, it filled the void that Christianity once owned, but without any of the wisdom, culture, and restraint that Christianity once provided. And I got another one of those. And another one says the online shame culture is Christianity with all the forgiveness sucked out. Cancel culture wants us to stay in the judgment of everyone. They want us to never forgive another's faults. So in our text today, we read about a man that was kind of like that. He would have felt totally at home in this present culture. That man was a Pharisee. He was a stone thrower. Jesus told this parable about him. He says, two men went up in the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed, thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like these other men. They're extortioners, they're unjust, they're adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I get. So you notice what that Pharisee did first. He declared how righteous he was. I'm not like those other guys. Then he proceeds to give God a list of who those other guys are just in case God hadn't been paying attention. Then he tells God why he's so righteous. I fast twice a week. I give tithes all that I get. He said, God, you're lucky you got me. <laughs> now, was this tithing a good idea? Well, Proverbs 3, 9, 10 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. And Malachi 3, 10 says, Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there will be food in my house. Thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the window of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more needed. So yes, God does love tithing. And was fasting a good thing? Yeah, me too. Well, yeah, Isaiah 5, 58, 9 tells us, if we do our fasting correctly, then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of God shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer you, and you shall cry, and God will say, here I am. So God does love fasting. And then Isaiah goes on to explain why fasting was beneficial. If you pour yourself out for the hungry and you satisfy the desires of those who are afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom shall be as noonday. In other words, fasting can give you extra money to help the hungry and the afflicted. And there's another part of that passage that the Pharisee had overlooked in Isaiah. So yes, God loved fasting and said that done the right way, fasting would speed your healing and kind of impress God. But then God put a condition in that verse that the Pharisee missed. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and the speaking of wickedness. The pointing of the finger. Yes, pointing fingers is when we focus on the failures and the faults of others. I'm not like these other people, not like the extortioners, look at them. Not like the unjust, just look at them, God. Not like the adulterers, oh, they're over there. Or even like this tax collector. I mean, look at him, God, because he's a tax collector, he's just pretending to be righteous. But he's not righteous. I am. God, you're lucky to have someone like me. So, was God lucky to have someone like this Pharisee? Well, no. The Pharisee himself was a stone thrower and a finger pointer. The Pharisee was impressed with himself, but Jesus wasn't. So comparing the Pharisee with the tax collector, Jesus said, I tell you, the tax collector went down to his house justified, much more than the Pharisee. For anyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. 
So what did that tax collector do that the Pharisee didn't? Then did he go and tithe more? I doubt it. Did he fast more? Probably not. But he did do one thing that the Pharisee did not do. He humbled himself more. The tax collector standing far off could not even lift his eyes up to the heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Be merciful to me, a sinner, God. The tax collector didn't point fingers. He didn't cast stones. He simply took a look at his own life and said, God, I'm sorry. Have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. And to say you're sorry actually means I'm filled with sorrow. And the tax collector was filled with sorrow about the sin in his life. So it occurred to me that Jesus is commending the tax collector for his humility. Jesus was impressed by this man admitting that he needed mercy and that he was sinful. Jesus is saying, that's the kind of mindset we've got to have. That's the kind of attitude we should shoot for. We need mercy because we are sinners. But wait, we're sinners? We need mercy? I thought God forgave us all our sins. I thought since he presented to us himself as a holy and pure in his presence, well, he did. In fact, we we're very special to God. We've been made in God's image. We have a destiny that God wants us to perform in our lives. We have a reason to live and a reason to exist. We are special to God. We are his children. But you and I must never forget that we're all sinners and sinners saved by grace. In the book of Ephesians, Paul's writing to the church of the Gentiles. So Gentile is Someone that's not a Jew, not circumcised. And this Gentile church had been approached by a group called the Circumcisers. These Circumcisers were folks that believed unless the Gentile was circumcised, they could not be saved. And these Circumcisers were so convincing they had gotten the Gentile Christians to doubt themselves that they had any value because they weren't circumcised. So Paul spends the entire first chapter of the letter to the Ephesians telling these Christians that they were important to God. They were saints. They had spiritual blessings from God. God had chosen them to be holy and blameless before him. They were predestined for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. They had been redeemed through the blood of Jesus. And they had been forgiven of their trespasses. They had been sealed by the Holy Spirit and that they had an inheritance waiting for them in heaven. That's who they were and that's who you are. But Paul writes this. But you were dead in your sin, trespasses and your sins in which you once walked. You were following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air and the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out our desires of our body and our mind and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of all mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love in which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together in Christ. By grace, you have been saved. They were dead in their sins. They'd been following Satan. They lived however they wanted to live. They weren't nice people. They're called children of wrath. <clears throat> but God loved them. He loved them even when they were dead in their sins. He loved them so much, he sent his son to die on the cross. He rescued them from the burden of their sinful life. He saved them even when they didn't deserve it. You see, that's the attitude that God wants from us. He wants an attitude that accepts the fact we don't deserve his love. An attitude that accepts we're never going to be good enough to be good enough to get into heaven. But that's not the attitude of the Pharisee. He figured he was just good enough the way he was. In fact, Jesus told that parable about him and says, the Pharisee, 
trusted in themselves because they thought themselves righteous. The Pharisee believed he was righteous, only trusted in himself. And you look at the contrast, the tax collector believed he was not righteous. And so he trusted in God, not himself. So we come to that position where we have to accept that we've got to trust in God. That our attitude would be more like that of a tax collector. John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace, once said it like this. I am not what I ought to be. I am not what I want to be. I am not what I hope to be in another world. But still, I am not what I once used to be. And by the grace of God, I am what I am. That's why the song Amazing Grace has such a powerful message to it. The background of that story, John Newton was a slave trader. He was in and out of prisons for failure in the military. And then one day, during a storm, he gave his life to Christ and saw all his wrongs. And that's when he penned those words, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. So why has this song been so popular over the years? Why is its message so important to so many people? It's often because a lot of people just don't like themselves. Back in 2011, Barna did a survey of Americans. And they found out that one third of those interviewed reported that they are struggling with an unresolved emotional conflict or just conflict in their lives. They often struggle with these thoughts. I'm worthless. I'm always going to be worthless. I will never be any different. I can't overcome the mess that I've made. I feel so stupid, weak, and no good. How can I expect anyone else to forgive me when I can't forgive myself? And that's a terrible way to live a life. So is there a way to cure that feeling of being worthless and the self-hatred? Years ago, there was a great gathering of religions held in Chicago. Practically every known religion was represented there, and many impressive messages were delivered. And during one session, a preacher named Joseph Cook stood up and said, Gentlemen, I beg to introduce to you a woman with great sorrow. Blood stains are on her hands. Nothing will remove them. That blood is that of a murderer and nothing shall take away that stain. She has been driven to desperation in her distress. So is there anything in your religion that will remove her sin and give her peace? He posed that question to the crowd. A hush fell over them. The speaker turned to one another for answers. Nobody said a word. Then raising his eyes to heaven, Joseph Cook cried out, I'll ask another question. Can you tell this woman how to get rid of her awful sin? Then he stood and waited as if listening for a reply. Then he turned and he says, The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So no matter how worthless you're feeling, the struggles, the fights in your life, it can all end. You can be covered in the blood of Christ. It's not real difficult. You just kind of make a confession. You've got to admit that you are a sinner. We all were sinners. We've all made this commitment. And ask for the forgiveness. To simply turn and look to Jesus and say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for what I've done wrong. And it doesn't mean you're going to stop doing wrong. There's going to be those hiccups in the room. Especially when you work with the public. Amen. <laughs> it's going to happen. But that's when you got to stop and realize the Spirit will help you get through it. 
You know, in this cancel culture, as we talked last week and we closed with last week, cancel culture is going to want to shut you up. They're going to mock you. They're going to make fun of you. They're going to hate you. They want you gone. Jesus never will. He's waiting. He's waiting for you. So what's our song going to be? Okay. <laughs> You're going to turn your hymnals to 326. You're going to stand and we're going to sing a cappella together softly and tenderly. We're still going to sing the first verse. If you feel like you need prayer, help of any kind, come forward, let us know. Rex now will be here. Any of one of the board members that's up here. So, before he's got expertise in it. <laughs> Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come Father, as we leave here today and gather for food in the back and celebrate the birthdays of the month and the anniversaries, I ask for your blessing upon that, Lord, and ask you to help and guide us this week. Put a little extra blessing upon us and a little extra touch and a nudge to keep us down the right path, being a better representative in a cold, dark world. And Lord, we know that true peace will come with your return. We await that return, Lord, because we hold steadfast to your promise. We are your children. You love us. We love you back, Lord, and we do not deserve any of this. So we thank you, we glorify, and we praise you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, who is the Christ, amen. 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 Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost.